Hello. Hello. Oh. Hey, there you are. Hey, how are you? <laughs> you guys look like you're in the library. We are, yes, yeah. We thought it would be an appropriate venue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your manifesto was very interesting because it proposed some models on how you might look into the future of the humanities. Um, so I have a question for you. Like, What made you want to write the manifesto? And uh, what are the contexts in which you were... Um, writing, you know, the multiple, multiple versions of the manifesto. I was invited uh, in 2007 to uh, be a, a fellow, Mellon Fellow at the Canadian Centre for Architecture with mm -hmm. the idea that we were going to develop an exhibition project for the Futurism Centenary in okay. 2009. So the 100 yeah. year anniversary of the public of Marinetti's founding manifesto of Futurism. Right. And, um, you know, so for really literally the two or three years before the H H Digital Humanities Manifesto, and I was spending a lot of time working on this <laughs> exhibition, yeah. publishing in the field, working with these kinds of materials. And um, uh, so the birth of the Digital Humanities Manifesto really came out of two circumstances. One was that. Yeah. The second was that uh, in 2008, uh, Todd Pressner, who was a former student of mine but mm -hmm. close friend who had subsequently gone from stanford to ucla had been developing a series of initiatives at ucla and the mellon foundation had provided some funding to support them yes. in the area of digital humanities mm -hmm. and so uh thanks to todd and a couple of his colleagues i was invited to teach to run and we did it together uh a mellon seminar that took place once a month throughout the 2008-2009 uh, academic year. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Todd and I had set up a, a, a very you know, lively sort of program for the whole year with different events, with people coming in talking about you know, emerging paradigms of work mm -hmm. using computational methods, mm -hmm. digital right. media, you know, the whole nine yards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't call ourselves digital humanists. We, we were th actually one of the big challenges was always ways to describe this, you know, essentially what were a series of experimental practices that we were interested in engaging with, but didn't really have a clear umbrella, but, you know, none of us liked, you know, computing in the humanities or humanities mm -hmm. informatics. And there were lots of people doing stuff with computers and literature that we didn't think was very interesting, that we weren't, we didn't want to repeat, but we weren't just media, we weren't just doing digital media, we wanted to try all kinds of like, ra you know, rational and irrational stuff up, you know, right. the one point, basically just text, right, yeah. the 2.0 version, I took all the materials that had been generated in this collaborative process, and then I added a visual apparatus, mm -hmm. so to, to really make a manifesto that, you know, sort of spoke a, a kind of language that was not just uh, verbal, but also iconic, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Those materials, we, I largely put those in, and then other members of the team of, are completed them. So, okay. uh, so it had this very you know complicated process. But what was really interesting in the end of this was that even though you know the sort of period of intense interaction around the original text sort of ended in this the phase where we issued the 2.0 version, um, it actually got a lot of press when we when right we did yeah. <laughs> yeah nuts on some of the multi the kind of media studies bulletin boards and, yeah. you know, attacking it and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Started into Chinese and you know it, it, versions started appearing all over the place so um, so it was fun it was it was intended as a serious exercise but it was in a, in a sense in a, on the one hand a little bit polemical and transgressive on the other to really carry out a kind of experiment in collaborative authoring mm -hmm. uh, yeah and um, I think in both ways, it, it, it had, you know, achieved its, its aim and much better than any of us could have predicted. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I have another question that's uh, more general. Um, so increasingly more and more scholars are compelled to um, learn about the digital humanities. And um, in your manifesto, you uh, offer some models 
how the humanities can reinvent itself. And it's to push for what the manifesto called a generative humanities instead of, instead of uh, uh, pushing for a sort of universal digital literacy culture only. So I, I'd like uh, if you would speak more about what you mean by the generative humanities. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that, you know, the uh, one of the things that the label digital humanities tends to obscure a little bit is, is at least in my view, is that, um, I mean, not only have, has there been more than half a century of um, mm -hmm. sort of a conversation taking place between the world of, of you know, in, information technologies and mm -hmm. the arts and humanities disciplines, but, but also that under the umbrella of digital humanities are grouped an extraordinary diversity of practices, some of which don't don't agree with one another right. in Absolutely fun, right. fundamental ways. Mm -hmm. You know, so that it isn't a, a unified umbrella; it's just mm -hmm. a kind of broad, kind of archipelago of yeah. you know, different yeah. different <laughs> islands. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and, um, you know, and and within under that really broad umbrella, there are people who argue, and I I, I have huge respect for many of them, even if I, it, it's not my argument. I, I don't completely agree with them. Uh, that you know we're moving towards a new kind of integration, a reintegration of elements within culture and knowledge fields that mm -hmm. have been kept apart during the last centuries. Um, a new kind of model of of literacy. Right. Uh, that maybe programming languages are languages like, you know, natural and historical languages and therefore should be added to kind of complete this new sort of model of a kind of universal literacy, we might say. Right. Um, and, um, uh, and I think those are all plausible notions, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, in our group, I think we, the, the core group who actually we went on from having co-authored these two you know, especially the second manifesto, mm -hmm. so writing digital underscore humanities for MIT Press, mm -hmm. which is in a sense the real answer to your question is, <laughs> is read digital underscore humanities. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Because we felt we've done the slightly irresponsible thing. Now we need to really sort of put out on the table what our vision is of what a generative humanities could be. And, uh, and that answer consists in a series of models of work that have been bubbling up in under the broad umbrella of the digital humanities that we think are the most interesting mm -hmm. have the most interesting the richest prospects um and i think all of them share certain fundamental assumptions one of them is that whatever we want to call it you know computation of the humanities computing of the humanities digital humanities that What's interesting about the collision and encounter between the digital and the humanistic is not that we bring in tools from the outside and we do simply the things that we right. are doing right. maybe a little bit better around the edges. Right. <laughs> rather, rather that when you bring those two words together, you do something that actually transforms the very nature of not what knowledge looks like, how it's experienced, how you communicate it, to whom does it speak. Uh, so generativity is a it's a metaphor, but it's a metaphor that I think is associated with the values of experimentation, mm -hmm. uh, with a with the notion of uh, denaturalizing our sense of where disciplines start and end, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about um, uh, about the new, about innovation in terms of genres, mm -hmm. and certainly. Uh, I also think it has it's connected to the idea. It's very much embedded somewhere deep in it in that term, but the, the idea of uh, a kind of model models of training and education that are more hands on, that are, are more like about making, right? Yeah, that we're thinking and making the mm -hmm. brain and the hand are in a closer relationship than in traditional humanities education. So I think right. generative also in the same sense of like uh, bringing stuff back to the table that traditional ideas of humanistic learning have tended to push to the side or to, you know, yeah. say that's fine in art school, but don't, you know, don't do it at Harvard. Right, right exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, and there's the, the line in the manifesto, right? The theory after theory with a capital T is anchored in making. And yeah. so often, I mean, uh, maker culture, I mean, now there's like maker fairs, you know, appearing all, all over. So I'm interested, I guess, maybe uh, in more of your thoughts about maker culture, the sort of maker culture that's arising and 
you know, I teach courses on digital writing, for instance, and a lot of that is platform. I teach them platforms for digital writing. It's we're at that late stage where it's sort of introducing them to these technologies. But the discourse around that is always, you know, what is going to, is this going to get me a job? All right. So there's this economic sense of like, if I use this technology, uh, you know, will I get a job? And you know, often that attention arises between this compulsion toward making and being a good user of these technologies. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, perhaps that tension and any thoughts about, you know, this rising maker culture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I've been really interested in the, that kind of emergence of making based practices. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, I started experiencing it a lot in, uh, you know, when I was, I was still, uh, well, certainly actually starting in the late nineties, really, I, I, I started feeling it quite a bit in San Francisco. Uh, and, um, it's just grown and grown and grown. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, it, it, it's taken a long time. It still hasn't really made it across the transom into all kinds of areas of the humanities. But I mm -hmm. think that the, um, that that's really been shifting just over the last maybe five years, right? Yeah. really beginning to happen. You know? mm -hmm. Not everywhere, but it's, it's beginning to happen in a more significant way. Being a little bit of an amphibious scholar with an interest in art practice, but contemporary art in particular, media-based art, but also in co communicating scholarly knowledge to bigger, less true, less you know, narrow audiences than the audiences of specialized journals and, and university press books, uh, and beginning to undertake some curatorial type. Uh, you know, sort of engagements. Mm -hmm. Those things for me really kind of crystallized the kind of making that is the traditional accepted model of scholarly practice, which has to do with writing yeah. you know, for certain genres, for certain kinds of forms. Mm -hmm. What if we opened that up, expanded that field, and began to think of scholarly the scholarship itself as a form of, of, of making in the much broader, more extended sense, and vice versa? What if right. we bring make the culture of making? to the table when it comes to communicating forms of uh, advanced uh, knowledge. And, you know, back to your question about the student expectations, I mean, which is a, yeah. it's an important question. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, I think that the, um, there is this tension between making as experimentation versus making as skill, you know, sort of acquisition of skills. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm on the experimentation side, and mm -hmm. I have the luxury of being able to be on that side. Mm -hmm. But my argument is always that, um, and I think it's an argument that's that many CEOs in Silicon Valley would support, <laughs> is that um, acquiring skills is 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 a trivial process by comparison with acquiring the capability of working across skill sets. Yeah. And one of the things that, if the digital humanities means anything, you know, it it certainly means the, a set of opportunities for models of training and, mm -hmm. sk and, and skill creation that include, have embedded within them, the challenges of working in teams, working with people with very different kinds of expertise, mm -hmm. because nobody can have all those skill sets. Uh, right. And the laboratory for me is the key concept, is the key mm -hmm. container, because it's a, it's a place where it's not about everybody becoming a coder, designer, right. scholar, yeah. right. writer thinker, uh, project manager, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. It, it's, it's about understanding what it means to work in a community mm -hmm. that is committed to, uh, in a sense, building something that no individual within that community could build on their own. Uh, right. And that's fundamentally different, of course, than uh, the traditional notion of what scholarship is. Uh, <laughs> Right. But it is, uh, but it, it isn't actually, when you really scratch below the surface, it isn't even that fundamentally different because the world of ideas is built on the shoulders of, you know, it's always built on, you know, it, you know ideas don't come from nowhere. They right. themselves have a genealogy mm -hmm. and we all have deep debts. It's just that the mode of production that's been favored by print culture has tended yeah. to insist upon the kind of monastic cell model. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, how knowledge is produced but the reality is that that knowledge is always being shared disseminated exchanged reproduced revised uh it's just that it has a different network that it gets played out on and i think we have a tremendous opportunity to and, and, and to really expand that network and enrich it in ways that are um, i think 
potentially at least transformational. Mm -hmm. We're just at the beginning of that adventure right now. Right. But, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I really agree with you, and I kept thinking about the pedagogical implication of what, what you're talking about, right? And as someone who is, um, I've been teaching for a few years now, one of my questions is, what, what kind of advice would you have for someone like me uh, in literary studies, someone who really want to think how to incorporate pedagogy in this discussion, um, ra uh, rather than thinking about digital technology as something, as you say, just something you use to get a job. <laughs> um, what advice would you give um, to younger scholars and teachers, most importantly, where they could um, start learning, start creating projects that understand digital humanities differently? Um, than just a user, right? Um, yeah. But more curating sense. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I think we're still so early in this this kind of transformation that's happening that um, that that for better or for worse, there is no single answer to that question. Right. 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 But I, I think that there are some. I mean, in my my view, at least, there there are some some nonetheless some. Uh, abiding features of the landscape even now in its early state of development. I mean, one of them is that, uh, you know, that experience, like, you know, just the, the mere fact of being part of a community is itself the most educational form of thing that you can do. So mm -hmm. in a sense, work people's projects is, it, it, it sounds like a weak answer, but I think it actually, this sort of apprenticeship model, you might say, of mm -hmm. like, wherever you have an opportunity to become part of a community that's engaged in a kind of practice. Yeah. Um, and if you have to start, you know, as the person who, you know, works the Xerox machine, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you really have to find points of entry that are your points of entry. Mm -hmm. Most successful models of like digital humanities and digital media projects basically work off of that diversity. And so yeah. to be in that diverse climate, and so you people think and mm -hmm. you hear how the technology works and you hear, you know, you hear what, you know, what a design process looks like. And right. you, yeah. you just kind of begin to enter into this cultural world, which is a very different world than the world of the classroom. It's the yeah. world of yeah. a kind of laboratory space. And you hear all these frictions, but you also hear how those frictions get addressed and overcome. And, um, and in the process, maybe you develop a specific niche where your skills are anchored. Uh, I think that's, in my view, that's like the, the best way to go. And some of it has to do with what your passions are. I mean, if yeah. you really are excited by video or you're really excited by sound or it's, you know, most of us have a particularly strong effective relationship to a given medium or mm -hmm. to a given problem uh, that kind of grabs us for whatever reason, that's always a good place to start. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. You know, but but again, I, I, I really like people who focus to to, fo to start at least with focusing on a really narrow set of skills that you develop, so that when you walk into the laboratory space, you bring something to the table, right? right. Your experience, but it's not like to be the factotum who can do everything. It's yeah. <laughs> it's it's because you know something that other people may not know through your own experience of like struggling with trying to get. Yeah. Uh, I don't know a gift to do this or yeah. <laughs> yeah. to try to create a you know I, I don't know there's every 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 skill area has a, a kind of knowledge that it brings a wisdom that it brings and um, the real challenge is stitching that into something big mm -hmm. that works and um, and it's that collaborative process that we don't have a really rich culture of in the humanities uh, yeah. and, and frankly the models in the sciences aren't necessarily all that great either. Mm -hmm. you, so we sort of have to invent that, and right. uh, that's part of the adventure. Um, right. That's wonderful. Yeah, I really like. I'm. I'm. A, I'm I believe in, uh, and I've certainly practiced this both at the humanities lab at Stanford and here at Harvard, in the in sort of breaking down the boundary line between the laboratory and the classroom. I I mm -hmm. love the, my favorite part of my teaching, uh, over the past fifteen years has really been courses where. There's a, an ongoing research project that has a moment in the classroom so that like students who are having a classroom experience have a kind of lab experience, but in the classroom, right. it's the students who are the most engaged by that go on, they become part of the laboratory team. Yeah, right. There's this cool. interesting kind of looping structure and mm -hmm. maybe they end up teaching 
like being part of the teaching mm-hmm. team next yeah. time class is offered. And then, you know, who knows where they go. But, mm-hmm. right. uh, but I think that creates a, a different kind of pipeline than the traditional humanities classroom where, yeah, in the classroom you study the you know, great works of Western literature and then you go home and you're in this other world. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think we haven't done a good job of creating a sense for students who are engaged by the arts and humanities that the humanities and arts classroom is just as attached to the world mm. as a chemistry lab. Yeah, I think actually that's pretty much all the questions we have. We don't want to take up too much of your time, but this has been a great conversation. Yes. I think so. Yeah, good luck on the project. It's a great project. Great. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you all.